Let's start off with the Apple Watch. Apple spent a surprising amount of event time on the watch, and that's because there's three new ones. The first of which being the new Series 8. The real upgrades of note here are the upgraded temperature sensors and the crash detection system. Starting with the former, Apple has upgraded and added a second temperature sensor on the Series 8. This allows Apple to provide more detailed health insights into sleep patterns, but the real feature here is better insights into women's health. Apple claims that with these new temperature sensors and some machine learning magic, the Series 8 can get a pretty accurate prediction into women's ovulation cycles to better monitor their reproductive health, which, hey, is pretty important to track for a number of things like family planning and unexpected changes in a cycle to be an early indicator of health issues or a reaction to a new medication. And as for the crash detection, the Series 8 is packed with a suite of sensors to near instantly detect a vehicle crash or a fall and alert emergency services. Any tool that aid with the preservation of human life is A-OK -okay in my book. The lesser watch shown off was the SE2, or just SE. There's not much to say here outside of it's essentially a Series 7 watch with a cheaper price of $249 for all of you ballers on a budget out there. But the finale of the watch segment was the Apple Watch Plus Ultra. Sorry, just Ultra. The Apple Watch Ultra is for those who do activities in the most extreme and remote environments, and it has the hardware and features to boot. The casing is made of titanium, and the button designs and mechanisms have been changed to support higher dust resistance, as well as up to 40 meters of submersion for scuba and freediving. And it is thick. Seriously, this thing looks massive on people's wrists. The bands are also important, and Apple has designed three bands, one for diving, one for hiking, and one for jogging. Each of these bands are supposed to do their best to keep the watch on the wearer's wrist as best as possible in their chosen environment. I personally think the Ocean one looks the coolest. The Apple Watch Ultra boasts enhanced sensors for the compass, depth readings, and the aforementioned temperature sensors. Finally, there are some pretty robust survival features packed in as well. The battery life is a cut above the rest, getting up to 60 hours on a low power mode, a Wayfinder night mode screen meant to keep your vision sharp in the dark, an SOS tone that can be heard around 600 feet away, and enhanced dual band GPS for incredibly precise location tracking, and a backtrack mode that shows the general path you've moved up to a certain point. And if all of this sounds expensive, it is. The Apple Watch Ultra starts at $799 USD. Yeesh. But it is important to keep in mind that this device is meant for individuals who frequent extreme locations. A couple of years after donning the mantle of Apple CEO, Tim Cook once stated that he wants Apple's legacy to be a significant contribution to healthcare. Considering how much time Apple spent on the watch, as well as all of the health and survival features put into these things now, Apple is well on track to leave that legacy, and are getting closer to another goal of Tim Apple's getting a medical device certification for the Apple Watch. Moving on to the AirPods Pro 2, or the new AirPods Pro, whatever Apple decides to call it, this segment was by far Apple's shortest at the event, and for good reason. While AirPods Pro are a huge product for Apple, and almost literally print money for them, there's only so much you can do to iterate upon them without starting to change the formula quite a bit. And iterate, Apple did. The AirPods Pro 2 have pretty standard generational improvements, increased battery life, better noise cancellation, and better audio quality. A couple of other nifty features are improved touch controls and a dynamic transparency mode, which Apple claims will automatically adapt the transparency mode to better filter out loud annoyances that might suddenly come up like construction. If it's not broken, don't fix it. Certainly seem to be the principle for the AirPods Pro 2, but hey, if you're fans of your AirPods Pro or have had them since launch in 2019, then the new ones seem like a very easy upgrade. Finally, let's talk about the reason why we're all here, the iPhone 14 and 14 Pro. Starting off with the lesser child, the iPhone 14, there's actually a bit of news here. The elephant in the room is there's now a larger version of the iPhone 14 Pro, aptly named the iPhone 14 Plus. Apple has finally brought back the Plus branding after dropping it post iPhone 8. The iPhone 14 carries the same notch design as the 13, but has some cool new features like an upgraded screen and a better optical image stabilization. The largest feature is a new satellite communications feature that allows the user of both iPhone 14 and iPhone 14 Pro to tap into the satellite comm network overhead and contact emergency rescue services. Apple is still on that survival kick. One maybe disappointing feature is the chip. Apple in the past has usually put their A chip in normal models, while a more beefed up A Bionic powers the Pro models. Departing from that trend this year, Apple put the A15 Bionic chip, so the one from the 13 Pro models, into the iPhone 14. 
because what's old is new again, apparently. In all seriousness, this was no doubt done to not only save on cost, but ensure a healthy supply chain amid an alleviating chip shortage. But it's hard not to feel just a little gypped at this. Speaking of removing things, Apple also removed the SIM card tray from the standard and pro models. Because reasons. So, users will have to rely on eSIM. Anyhow, the iPhone 14 has a 6.1 inch display starting at $799 USD, and the iPhone 14 Plus has a 6.7 inch display starting at $899 USD. Finally, the iPhone 14 Pro and Pro Max. The premium devices featured this year's latest and greatest chip, the A16 Bionic, and primarily screen upgrades like up to 2000 nits of peak screen brightness outdoors. I suppose we can finally talk about that giant black pill at the top of the screen. Apple has designed away from the notch, and has now implemented what they call the Dynamic Island. This might be a hot take, but Samsung called and said they want their 2019 phone back. This cutout looks ugly, and quite frankly, worse than the rabbit ear notch Apple had going. Perhaps the worst part is that this indicates Apple is still several years out from releasing a device with all the front-facing modules underneath the screen, so we have to live with it for a while. On the brighter side, Apple seems to be having fun with the dynamic island, and iOS 16 is programmed to take full advantage of it. Things like window stemming from the island, or using it to extend an info bar or split some info up. Kind of cool, I guess, but also kind of gimmicky. It seems like a better use of space than what Samsung did with theirs, which was absolutely nothing. While we're talking about the screen, the screen's bezels are even smaller than before, but the overall edge and back design is reminiscent of the 13 Pro. To briefly touch on the camera, the primary camera now has a 48 megapixel sensor, the largest ever in an iPhone. And with the sensor upgrade comes the ability to shoot video in 8K, which you can transfer to another device at the blazingly slow speed of USB 2.0 because of the lightning port. Finally, the iPhone 14 Pro models come in at the same sizes as the regular 14s, but are 999 USD and 1099 respectively. This was actually a pleasant surprise, as in this economy, rumors were running wild that Apple was going to hike the price of the Pro models. So let us know in the comments below what you think of Apple's newly announced devices. If you'd like to see my experience switching to Apple, check out our video here, and I'll see you guys next time.